Well, good morning, everyone. I think I don't think I'm on yet. Am I all right? Okay, there we go. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, uh, we're in the second Sunday of, uh, of a new year, uh, and we're uh, one Sunday away from beginning our series, uh, uh, getting it kicked up again in the book of Romans. So I'm, I'm sorry if you're disappointed we're not in Romans today. Uh, Michelle came in, Michelle Roebuck, and she thought there was a typo because it said Revelation uh, in the bulletin, but it is no typo. Uh, we are in the book of Revelation today, and I want to invite you to book of Revelation chapter 2, chapter 2, uh, if you want to turn there in preparation for what we're going to do. I had a, a great first hour. I was here at 9 o'clock meeting with uh, a group of children talking about uh, church membership and baptism this morning. And we walked through the plan of salvation today uh, with the kids this morning. Uh, and it was a sweet time uh, this morning. I appreciate uh, the moms and dads and the guardians getting up and being there with the kids this morning. Next uh, two weeks from now, we have our follow-up session. And then we're going to talk about uh, what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, talking about reading our Bibles and praying. Talking about being a part of the church and talking about baptism. Is what we're going to talk about. Over the interim of these next two weeks, they're writing out their stories of them and Jesus. And so mom and dad are going to be working with them uh, to talk about where they are uh, in their relationship with Jesus. So I enjoyed that this morning uh, and look forward to our next session. We hope to have another one. Uh, this one, I was so excited about how it went this morning. We'll try to have another one a little bit later on. Uh, if you're thinking these are for kids uh, ages 5 to 12 is what we had this morning. So I uh, hope you're, uh, if you're thinking about that for your own child, it'd be a great thing. Uh, I am a Lord of the Rings fan, uh, and uh, the movies uh, are, are old now, but I do have a, um, uh, a tradition, especially with one of my daughters, that usually on the holidays we usually uh, watch one of the series of the Lord of the Rings, uh, either the original, the three of them, the the Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King, or uh, the three-part series of The Hobbit, which I think was too much for the smaller book. But uh, we do watch those uh, on occasion. Uh, and one of the favorite uh, parts in, in those movies is in the second movie, uh, The Two Towers. Uh, and it's a famous battle, if you're aware of uh, the Tolkien's books, it's called The Battle at Helm's Deep. And this is a battle where all the baddies are coming up against uh, the few people that are holding out in this fortress. Uh, and the king, King Theoden, uh, is famous, and, and there's a scene where uh, things are looking bad. Uh, there's utter chaos and destruction. Uh, people are dying by the dozens. Uh, uh, the uruk as they're called, uh, the, the forces in league with the evil one, Sauron, have have broken into the fortress that they thought was impenetrable. Uh, they're making their way through, uh, and he looks out uh, as he's sitting uh, inside uh, the fortress with the gates being pounded and the gates about ready to break down, and all of the uh, opposing forces are breaking through. And he looks and he says, What can man do against such reckless hate? What can man do against such reckless hate. You know, we, we're in a moment where uh, for Americans, if we were in China or we were in uh, places in Malaysia or Sudan, uh, they have lived in the face of uh, the kind of hate that we have never experienced, and by God's grace, may we never experience uh, in terms of that. But we live in a moment where uh, things are crumbling uh, in the culture in which we live. And they're crumbling in pretty dramatic ways and in ways that in my own life uh, and in the lives of many are unprecedented. And the language of love and hate is everywhere. Um, uh, we're in a place where um, uh, the challenges of the day are marked by, not by moving out against these uruk or this mythological thing, but where God as creator is being denounced and where the potential and limitations that he's built into creation are being denied. And I put this to myself, and how are we, as the people of God, to respond when to be followers of Christ is to be viewed as dangerous bigots? I don't think I've ever heard the term dangerous more than I've heard it now. 
dangerous speech, right? Dangerous bigots, or you're a psychotic person who's plagued by unreasonable fears. You have all kinds of phobis, phobics, right? You're homophobic, you're, mis, uh, you're uh, transphobic, you're phobic of everything. And so uh, if I'm a person who believes what the scriptures teach, I'm really a psychotic person who is plagued by many, many fears, uh, and I'm a person who needs mental help. So to be a psychotic person plagued with unreasonable fears, even in the face of, and this is one of the things that has tipped the thing for me, uh, that, has, has, that has made me uh, take a different step forward in my own thinking, even while children are being encouraged to free themselves of their God-given potential and limitations through chemical and physical mutilation by some of the primary authorities in our culture, from our president all the way down. And we're in a moment where it seems to be that, and people like myself who might stand up and say, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's healthy for kids. Matter of fact, I don't think that should be taught in any school. I don't think that should be put forward by any of our authorities. I think that's inherently destructive. I think it's just an unmitigated evil to try to do that to children. Well, for myself, I'm a person here who's bigoted and hateful and somebody who's dangerous, right, in the world in which we live. So the question is here, this is the question that I want to ask you, right? And I want to probe here, and this is the reason why I have you in Revelation chapter 2. And this fits along with what Van was speaking about today, right? The world has not changed in the sense that all of a sudden people are different than they have been since they fell in the Garden of Eden, right? We're still broken, sinful people, right? The flavor of sin or the way in which it's manifesting itself or what's being promoted in a given setting may be different, or emphasized at different periods of time. So we're not facing really any different challenge than they were in the first century when they lived out their Christian faith in the face of a pagan Roman Empire, right? A pagan Roman Empire uh, that encouraged, uh, for example, one of the things that encouraged uh, families uh, to abort their children and to abandon their children. And so one of the things that set Christians apart early on in the Christian Roman, in the Roman Empire, is that Christians would regularly go out to the town, the town trash dumps, and pick up abandoned children, mostly daughters, and adopt them because they would leave them. The Romans would leave them at the trash dump, and then uh, slave traders would go out and pick up these kids, raise them, turn them into sex slaves, and other things along those lines, or they would simply die of exposure. And so Christians would go out and pick up these children and adopt them into their families, and raise these kids, right? So we live in a culture that abandons children, that treats children as an inconvenience, uh, that's willing to kill children if they will encumber your life in any kinds of thing, that basically the vast majority of children who die in the United States are killed as an act of birth control. The vast majority, right, in terms of that. So that we live, we don't live in a, in, a, in a different time in terms of the fact of the sinfulness of people and the brokenness of the world. The question, though, that I want to ask, right, is how do we stand for truth without succumbing to hate? How do we love not only those who despitefully use us, this is a phrase from Jesus, but those people who harm the innocent and condemn us for standing against them? How do we love them? How do we hold on to truth with a passion for those abandoning it? How do we do that, right? You can lose yourself in doing the right thing and in standing for the right thing. Now, this is what drew my attention. I've been praying and thinking about this for my own struggle. Some of the things that I hear and that I read about and I get exposed to do make me absolutely furious, Right? I don't know if you've ever had that, that moment where you hear something is going on and you just want to do something, you want to break something, you want to yell at somebody, you want to say, how on earth how can you lose your mind and encourage people to do these things? Right? And I, I don't want to run off hat-cocked and you know, punch a hole in the wall right? or run around outside and scream right? or get mad at Rana or, or send off some half-cocked letter to somebody. Right? So those kind of things like that. But how do I do that? And, and, but it's even beyond that. How do I respond to these things that are happening? But, but how do I keep a heart for the people who are involved in that, that I love for them and yearn them to co- for them to come to Christ? How do I do that? Right? How do we do that as the people of God? Right? 
And, I, and I'm saying this to you because uh, one of the things that happens to us when we get into an environment the way we are is already, right, when you talk about people about sharing their faith, what are the, some of the challenges to sharing their faith? Some of his people say, well, I'm just not an extrovert. Uh, some people would say, um, you know, I, uh, I just don't know how to do it. Well, those things can be, can be overcome. But when the environment gets hostile, that's when people are even more reticent to represent Jesus, right? And they may even go incognito, or they may in turn, on the other side, just become people who are battling against people instead of people who are battling for their hearts. And so this is why I, I, I came to Ephesians 2, or Revelation chapter 2, to Jesus' letter to the church at Ephesus, okay? Now, uh, I think, I've often wondered, right, as I've read through these letters, these are the famous letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, I often wonder every time I read them, if Jesus were to write a personal letter to EBC, what would the letter be? Right, what would he write us about? What would be his commendations? What would be his criticisms? I hope we wouldn't fall into the church of Laodicea. When you read through the seven churches, there's only one church that he has nothing positive to say, and that's the church at Laodicea. There's a couple churches he doesn't have anything negative to say about, like the church at Philadelphia. Right? But when he comes to the church at Ephesus, he has some commendations, but he also has some condemnations for them. And I think it's a, it's a timely warning for us, right? Now, the book of Revelation, well, I guess I should turn this on. Uh, the book of Revelation as a whole, right? If we come to John's famous statement here, I can't, something's missing from there, the rest of that. But let me read you, it's verse 3 of chapter 1. If you can back up, I just want to read uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it, and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. Okay? Now, I, I, I hope, right, by the virtue of looking at this passage today, that we'll know the blessedness of the Lord and His provision for us, for our protection, for our growth, right, for our effectiveness in serving Him. But also, as he says here, the time is near. What he's referring to is the, the time that all the events in the book of Revelation look at, the consummation of God's program in history. Right? One of the things that, that the scriptures are very clear about and Christians are united in is that history is moving in a direction. And it's under the control of the God of history. And one day there's going to be a wrap-up. And when John's writing, he's talking about the time is near, meaning the time that God's going to wrap up his purposes in history. And if it was near then, it's nearer now. Right? And one of the things that the whole book of Revelation is said, what kind of people should we be to use a phrase from 2 Peter, what kind of people should we be knowing what the end will be? And the big message in the book of Revelation is that the end will be marked by the return of Christ that will judge his enemies and vindicate his people. And given the fact that we know what the end will be, what kind of people should we be today? And so this is what uh, Ephesians uh, the letter to Ephesus is about is helping the church be prepared to live out their life as they wait for Christ to consummate his program in history, right? So would you stand with me? And I want to read through this uh, section together. If you would follow along and stand in honor of God's word as we read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Now, if you have your uh, bulletin, you'll see that there's some notes in there. I hope you'll, you'll take the opportunity to write down a few things as we work our way through. 
uh, and talk about uh, this little letter to the church at Ephesus, okay? Now, first thing here that we want to talk about is who it's written to, but if you're filling in the blanks, here's what I want you to talk about the speaker first. We're going to talk about who's spoken to, but the speaker, and here's this phrase, the all-powerful and everywhere present for his church, right? The all-powerful and everywhere present for his church. That's who's speaking. The resurrected Christ is speaking, the one who is all-powerful and everywhere present for his church. Okay, we're going to come back to that. Now, the imagery that you have here, and there's imagery here, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and we have from the end of chapter 1, if you look back in chapter 1, verse 19, it says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, Right? So the stars are symbolic for the angels of these churches, and the lampstands are symbolic for the churches themselves. So when he introduces Jesus, he says he's the one that holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, every one of these letters begin with a description of Jesus, and they have to do with something that describes him, that gives him the authority and right to be listened to, right, as he addresses the churches, right? So here's the, the first thing when he says to the angel. Uh, many people have tried to explain what this angel is. The Greek term is just transliterated here. The Greek term is angelos, that when it gets translated, transliterated into English, it becomes angel. And so it's not really translated. Uh, and the question comes, uh, angelos, the Greek word, can mean messenger, like a human messenger, like I would send a human messenger somewhere, or it can mean an angel. And some people try to argue that angel here refers to the pastor of the church, so he's writing to the messenger that's supposed to bring this message to the church. But the problem with that is everywhere else in the book of Revelation, every other time, without exception, angel refers to a spiritual being that is under the authority of God. And there's no reason not to think of that here, and it reminds the church that the church is caught up in a cosmic struggle, that the church lives in a multi-storied reality in which there are beings at work and active and the most important, significant ones are ones we cannot even see. And so it takes us back into that reality of the fact that we're caught up in a struggle for the hearts and minds of people, as Paul would say it, right? You remember the end of the book of Ephesians, our battle's not with flesh and blood, what with powers and principalities and high places, okay? So we're in a struggle that is cosmic in orientation, and this is reminding the church that you're just not there in your church. Your problem isn't the person sitting next to you, right, or the person that irritates you when you walk in, or your husband or your wife, or your mom or your dad. That's not the primary threat to your life. The primary threat to your life is the evil one who wants you to give reign to the darkness in your own life, to turn you away from the God who created you. Okay? It's he who is opposing every work of God in this world, right? And you're in that struggle. And so when we're involved, right, we're not fighting uh, a political party. We're not fighting different interest groups. We're not fighting people who put a particular flag up or whatever the case may be. We're in a spiritual struggle for the hearts and souls of people, okay? And we have to remember that. Right? And we're going after here. And we're not in a, a neutral playing field, right? We're in something where we as followers of Christ, we know that a struggle is there. And until Christ returns and completely establishes his rule without reserve when he returns, we're in a time where the evil one is at play. He's at play around us, within us, and in the lives of people, right? So we're caught up in this cosmic struggle. This reinforces our identity as a church, as a heavenly outpost in the midst of a cosmic struggle, and we need divine help to accomplish what we're going to do, right? The reason why, right, what's keeping you from opening your mouth for Jesus just isn't, right, the fact that you're not articulate, right? There's an evil one who's busy trying to discourage you from identifying with Jesus, right? How many of you have ever, you, you've got an opportunity, and I know we've all had it, somebody's sitting there, and we get prompted to talk to them about our faith, right, to introduce Jesus, in. and immediately you think of all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. 
I mean, it's amazing how many you can come up with. Oh, maybe the time isn't right, right? Well, I don't, I don't know how to, how to begin it, right? Or what will other people think of me at this moment, right? Well, there's just, you know, too, too, too short of a time. And all of a sudden, you've got 30 reasons why you shouldn't open your mouth. And you think, well, where does that come from? I'm pretty confident that doesn't come from the Spirit of God, right? It's amazing how that happens, okay? How, how you, can, you can be in your home and somebody does something, right, that's a part of who they are. And my, my wife and I, we experience this all the time. And all of a sudden, you overreact to it. You forget that that's just the way the person is. And then you assume that they did it just on purpose to hurt you. Well, that's not true. But you, lump, you just jumped right to it. When we're in that kind of struggle, we need divine help to not only love one another, but to represent Christ to the world. We need divine help, right? Now, Scripture never encourages us to wonder, well, who's the angel of EDC? I wonder what they look like. No, Scripture's never interested in that, never encourages us to pray to angels, to try to figure out where they are, what's going on. We don't look to them. They're completely under the sovereign, risen Christ's control. He dispatches them as he sees need. Okay? We just know that he's at work and things are busy and that we're caught up into that but he reminds us of the risen Christ. Now, two things he says about the risen Christ, if you want to look at him here, right? So, heavenly figures overseeing Christ's work, and then we're heavenly outpost in this cosmic struggle. So, two things he says about Christ here that I think are important, right? And here's what he says. I know you're, I I hold the stars in the right hand, and I walk among the seven golden lampstands, okay? Now, this is, Pastor Steve emphasized this last week. One of the things that God calls upon us to believe and to trust him for is that Christ is present. He is present with all that that means for his potential and power, right? He said it explicitly to us, Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching them everything that I taught you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I am with you always. Because all authority has been given to me, right? Well, one of the places that he is, is he's with us as his people, right? Matter of fact, Paul would describe the people of God when we gather together as a temple, a place where God uniquely manifests his presence. He is here among us, right? The cosmic struggle for your heart, your mind, your passions and priorities is happening right here. The struggle for you to focus on what God wants you to hear, to listen, to respond to it. That's all happening right here. And and Christ is with us. He sees your heart. He sees mine. He knows the dynamics of EBC. And it's talking about Christ is everywhere present. He knows these things. He's not only everywhere present for our accountability, but he's everywhere present for our provision. Right? So he's walking among the lampstands. He's with his people. And, right, he holds these cosmic powers in his hands. He's all powerful and he's all present. So this is the Lord who comes to address us, the Lord of the church, right, who governs the church. It's his church. He's the head of his church, right, and we serve him, right? So he has the right and authority to speak to us and he is seeing us and providing for us, right? So this is, this is the resurrected Christ. Now, as he speaks, though, he's speaking against the backdrop. And I just give some things here to illustrate, right? The church in Ephesus uh, is in a place that's renowned for its pagan worship. So the fourth largest city in the, in, the, in the Greco-Roman world, it's just a nexus for all kinds of cosmopolitan religions, everything else. Anything you can imagine of the debauchery of the ancient world, you would find it in Ephesus, right? A large city with all the things that come with it. Hey, one of the things it's most uh, famous for is the worship of Diana, That's the Latin name. Uh, Artemis is the Greek name. But it was a very prominent, one of the wonders of the world, the Artemisium, the temple there. Uh, In the ancient world, your temples were your banking institutions, right? You put your money on deposit on the temple. And the, the temples had as much money as they thought the god or goddess was powerful. So they thought Artemis was super powerful, so the Artemisium was super wealthy, right? So they invested the money. They had all kinds of of projects that they did to raise money. It was super wealthy, and it was renowned for its magic. It was renowned for its power, 
right, in terms of those kind of things. Well, that was the everyday life. You can read about it if you want to in the Bible. In, in Acts chapter 19, when Paul goes into Ephesus and he starts proclaiming the gospel, everybody gets offended that he's challenging the supremacy of Artemis. And they run out into the streets and they go, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they throw the Christians, right, and, and, and get them in trouble because they're threatening the supremacy of Artemis, okay, and all the economy that's built on Artemis, right? So this, the Christians in their day, Paul, John is writing against the backdrop of real opposition from pagan worship. And of course, where's John when he's writing the book of Revelation? He's on the island of Patmos. Why is he on the island of Patmos? Because he's been disappeared by the Roman government. Okay, one of the ways that they had to deal with uh, threats to the empire is you just made them disappear. And Patmos, we know from history, was one of those islands in the Aegean Sea where they took one of the high-value threats. So they stuck John out there because he was in opposition, so he knows the teeth of that. And then on top of that, right, emperor worship had reached a zenith, really, in the early Roman Empire. So this is Domitian, who's the backdrop here. Uh, Domitian, uh, think, you know, we, we have our own presidents, our own uh, premiers, our own uh, uh, rulers, right, in terms of those things. I don't have one, thankfully, in America right now who wants to be called Lord and God, okay? Kurios kaitheos is the Greek phrase. Domitian said, I want you to address me as God. Well, Christians had a problem with that, and that made them traitors to the Roman Empire. It made them people unwilling and unable to swear their allegiance to the Roman Empire. And this had a great impact on Christians. It caused a lot of opposition, persecution. And so they have persecution all around them. But I want to say uh, as well of that, and I want you to look down in verse 6 before we come to this slide here. Come down to verse 6. And this is one of the obscure things in this little letter. It says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practice of the Nicolaitans. One of the things that we don't know is we don't know clearly just who the Nicolaitans were. Some people have tried to go after their name. Nicolaitan is a, is a mashup of two Greek words, conquer and people. And they've been associated in the history with church with any types of movements or people who want to abuse and use other people and, and kind of consume them. The predominant view of them is that they're a group of Christians who've really kind of a, co a compromise with the pagan world, and they've taken up all kinds of deviant sexual behavior, and they brought it into the church. In other words, these are internal threats on the, as well as external threats, and so the church at Ephesus is dealing with threats from within as well as threats from without, okay? Now, I know I've mentioned this to you before, right, as a church, I don't expect as a follower of Jesus because Scripture teaches me that, I don't expect people who don't know Jesus to care about the things of Jesus. I don't, I don't expect that. I don't expect people who don't know Jesus to care about the things of Jesus. It doesn't mean that people can't behave rightly and can't do good things and so forth and so on, but I don't expect them to have God's priorities. That doesn't surprise me. What becomes very troubling in the time that we're in right now is where we have people from within the church who come out and say that a biblical sexual ethic needs to be let go of. The fact that God created men and women, that needs to be let go of. When it happens from within the church, that's when it's unnerving. That's when it's difficult. You thought you were standing on some firm ground, and now all of a sudden the people you thought you were in league with, you thought were standing with you, in the truth, all of a sudden, the, they're crumbling the foundations under you. That's what's unnerving. And so I want you to see for the Ephesians, right, they're facing trouble from without and trouble from within, right? And, and from within is even more difficult. It's, it's difficult in this day and age, right, when somebody comes to you bearing the name of Jesus, you have to ask, well, what Jesus is this? I need to talk to you about this Jesus because the, uh, it's, it's a, one of the things right now, you've got you to talk with somebody for a while to figure out if this is the real Jesus or not. And if you leave the scriptures which reveal to us who Jesus are, well, Jesus becomes anything and he approves of everything where we are. 
So that's their backdrop where they are. Now, let's look at what he says in terms of their commendation, what he has to say about commending them. And here I just put the word standing solid, okay? Standing solid. He commends them for standing solid. What he says here, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Right? So there, there's a kind of a, a passive and an active thing, right? They've also, uh, they cannot bear. They themselves don't tolerate evil, right? They don't tolerate evil within their midst. The practices that are around them in their heathen culture, they don't tolerate them. And on the other hand, they've sussed out people who've professed to be Christians actively, and they've tested them and found out who the people who are really false representations of Jesus, right? Now, we're not heresy hunters at EBC. I'm not heresy hunter in the culture at large. But one of my responsibilities as a shepherd is to protect the flock from wolves, that's Jesus' own terminology in John chapter 10. And there are a lot of people who speak in the name of Jesus who don't represent Jesus. And it's my job, and this is one of the other things First John will talk about, that a pastor is, is meant to be hospitable. P Timothy will talk about this too. Well, a part of that hospitality is not just opening your home to people. It's knowing who to open the door to to allow them access to the church. So my job is to pay attention to when somebody speaks in the name of Jesus, a lot of times I need to talk to them a little bit further because that may not take us far enough to know really who they are and what they represent. Well, here they've persevered. They've stuck at it, and they've had some real threats from within. They've had the Nicolaitans that have apparently caught up a group of people. They've had external things, but they've persevered, right? And they've held on to the truth. And we want to pause here before we move on to the next part, which is the center, is that this is a real good. One of the things that, that people want to do in response to that is sometimes, right, if you've been in a place where you've been persecuted for your faith, you'll hear, you'll hear people give up on what's true in order to get along. Well, they didn't give up on what's true, but they didn't stay where they needed to. So we say here, they will not put up with evil. They tested and rejected false prophets. They persevered in holding on to the truth over against a dark world and a compromised church, right? So they were struck, they, they persevered, okay? But what's he say in terms of his uh, correction, okay? And here, I want you to put the term dying love, dying love. They were standing solid, but they have a dying love, a dying love. So here's what he said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Okay, now this is, this is a, hard to know what he means by the love at first, right? Your first love. This is a famous one. I remember reading it in King James for the first one, okay? You've forsaken your first love. There's at least two senses of first, and I think both of them are at play, okay? So the one here, right? So lost, uh, Christ has lost first place, right? So first, your first love, meaning your primary love, okay? Let me illustrate this with you, okay? I tell my students all the time at, at school, and I do mean this, I love them. I love my students. And the ones I get to know, they have a special relationship with me over the course of the time. Some of them I follow them through their whole four years while they're there. But I tell them I love them, but I don't love them like I love my own daughters. Right? And I love my mom, but I love my wife more. That's hard on every mom. Right? Moms get replaced in terms of first, and rightly so. There's something disordered with me if I put my mom over my wife. There's something wrong with me as a professor if I elevate my students over my own daughters. And so it's not just who I love, but what order I put my loves in. And so this one here is to have Christ first, is to have him the primary love that orders all your other loves. Because Christ is the one that to love him with your, all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's the one that transforms you to be a person who wants to love other people and teaches you how to love them, right? So they've lost him as first, as the one who's orienting their life. 
And therefore, it's, it's even misshapen their stand for the truth. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Right? The second sense here is to lose the kind of passion that you had for Christ at the first, right? At the beginning of your relationship with Him. Okay, now we all know this is, you know, one of the cycles in a marriage relationship, right? You get started. We, I see this all the time that happens at Cedarville. You're a couple, they don't know each other. Uh, then they start to associate with each other. Then uh, it's almost as if they're Velcroed to each other. Uh, right, and they can't be apart from each other. They can't, you know, uh, for five minutes, they got a schedule on how to be back together. When they're sitting together, some part of their body has to be touching the other person, uh, right, those kind of things like that. Their friends are going crazy because they, they only talk about their beloved, right, all the time, and their friends feel like they've been eclipsed and they've disappeared, right, all those kind of things that happen. The flush of first love and the delight that you take in being loved by that person is something that we've experienced or you've enjoyed from your parents or enjoyed from someone in your life where you've been loved by someone generously and it creates this response in you that you want to love in return and you delight in it. But we also know that love can grow cold. Matter of fact, Jesus warns in Matthew that one of the characteristics of these last days is the love of many will grow cold. And I don't think that that's That's necessarily primarily love for other people. It's the love for God that energizes and directs your love for people. And so it tends to grow cold. And so let me give you some examples of how that kind of happens, right, if you're a follower of Jesus. There are Christians who in the day satisfied merely with the fact that they really didn't blow it or do anything bad. Yet there's no connection to Christ no longing for his delight or presence. Right, this is the joke about parenting teens, right? The minimal expectation of parenting teens. I'm happy, you know, that my kids got through the teen years. They're not pregnant. They're not dead. They're not in jail. Amen. Right? Now, that, that's a pretty low threshold for parenting. Right? That's a pretty low threshold. And for some, some people, our Christian life devolves in, well, I didn't do anything really bad today. I'd say I didn't do anything really bad today. That was a great day. But the question on the other side is, what did you do? Who were you pursuing? Where did Christ fit into your life? Right? Second one, the Sunday school teacher is happy with a controlled class, a lesson covered, and a responsibility met, yet there's no yearning in her heart for hearts to be awakened to God. There's no prayer for hearts of her students, no willingness driven by love to enter into the hard work of love. No correction, but connection, right? Not just information, but transformation. Not just an outward calm, but an inward peace. Or how about this one? The musician who gets up in the front, and they considered a good morning to be one where everyone showed up. Nobody made mistakes. We got our appropriate time in the service, and the people responded to us. But there's no yearning to connect with God in their singing, to please His heart, to draw the worshipers into a deeper relationship with God. That's devoid of passion. Or how about this one, the dutiful spouse who's emotionally detached from their husband or wife, but consider that they are doing fine because they did not have an affair. They're responsible. They do their part, right? Right? They avoid unwise relationships with members of the opposite sex. They discourage others from abandoning their commitments. They speak out against infidelity in any of its forms, but when they are asked why, they don't seem to be able to cast a vision for marriage itself. And thus, for why it's good to remain faithful for reasons more than just God says so. Okay, I put it to myself this way. This is a life for a church that has a commitment to a clean house to the point that no one wants to live in it. The cleanliness does not serve hospitality. It doesn't serve nurturing. It isn't soothing. It isn't loving. It doesn't promote belonging or comforting or healing or reaching. It prides itself in everything being in order, nothing messed up, everybody obeying the rules. It's not ready for the messiness and brokenness of lives who need to be healed and reach for Jesus. You follow me on that? There's a coldness about it. 
So what does he say in terms of remedy? Right? What does he say about it here? He has a remedy. Three things. Remember, repent, repent, and do the first works. Right? And here I think this is one of the things by God's grace. I, I, I know I've mentioned this before. This is where the communion comes in. This is why I think God's wisdom for us in the communion. One of the practices is it takes us regularly back to the event of what Christ did for you, of who you were, what he did, and what it now means. And I, and I, I, I know this from Scripture, is that you need divine help to re-enter that good truth again and again and again to have your heart softened to the things of God. Right? And so always in Scripture, to remember is to go back to the past of something that God has done to bring about his goodness and grace in your life. And you go back and you hold on to that event by the power of the Spirit to bring that truth back in relationship with your life to change the way you think and feel. There's just, uh, you know, there are events, uh, you know, uh, many of us have wasted a good bit of our life watching reels, right, from Instagram or some other place, right? And there are some things, and this is why the feels, right, as they say, the feels from the reels, right, as you go there and you watch them, there are certain things that happen when you see an act of, of just sweet love or of sacrifice for another person or sweetness there, it just wells up and draws something out of you when you see it manifested. Right? And here we need to keep going back and back again to say, you were lost. You were hated and hating other people. You had no hope, no purpose. You were without God in the world. You had no people, no place to belong. You had hell in your future and everything missing from its present. And Christ came in and delivered you, and you didn't deserve it, and he rescued you from the path you were on, even though you were rebelling against him, as we're going to read in Romans 5, 8, even while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Right? Christ died for you. And so this is the moment where we can't forget that. There are some things in our life we cannot get over. And he says, you've got to go back and remember. And you've got to go back and repent, right? This is where he says here, consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand. What he's saying here is the idea of repent is to change your mind about things, right? One of the things that happens when you get into chaos and when you get into threats and people are after you, your, your eye can get on the people who are after you and get off of Jesus, right? So you feel like you're embattled and you're fighting and thinking about this group of people and instead of getting on your knees and saying, God, help me to love these people. God, help me to represent you toward them. God, help me to hold on to the truth with a heart yearning for them to come to know you. God, help me not to fear them. Help me, Lord, to step forward boldly. And that's not, not with naivete. There's no promise in Scripture that when you step forward and represent Christ that everything's going to go well. That's not because, oh, now everything's going to go great. I'm going to step out there and everybody's going to love me. No. Jesus promises the more you look like me, the more they're going to treat you like me. That's what he promises. You're going to be hated for my name's sake. But Jesus did it, and he, if you remember the picture, one of the pictures of Jesus, he walks up to Jerusalem. He came to his own, and his own would not, what? Would not receive him. What does Jesus do? He comes to Jerusalem, and he weeps over them and says, they're just, they need a shepherd. They need someone to come. Oh, that you would turn. And that's where we need to be, right? But we need Jesus to keep making us those kinds of people, or else we become fearful, embattled, separationist, right, attacking Right? We need to repent of the desire just to protect ourselves, of to, of to be proved right, right? This is not about being proved right, right. We just need to be faithful to Jesus. Let the chips fall where they may. Okay. We're going to come across this verse. We came across it in Romans. I want to live this way. Let God be true and every person a liar. Let God be true. Stand for him, right? And do the first works. Now, I wrote a list. These are Spurgeon's. My time's coming up here. Spurgeon wrote out of the markers of the first love of a Christian. I thought they were interesting, right? He says, do the first work. And here's one of the ways that you can tell your passion has dropped. Okay? Your passion has dropped. And some of you can recall this. 
I, I see Marty's face over here because I, I've set and heard Marty's testimony. Uh, and Marty can't tell his testimony without weeping. He's just a big baby. Uh, he just weeps about it. Uh, I can't, every time he tells his testimony, and it's something to weep over. And one of the things that happened when you first came to Christ, some of you remember it, uh, not a single thing in the Bible we didn't consider precious. You know that something's wrong with your relationship with Christ when his words to you are no longer compelling. And everybody else is more interesting. That's one, right? Second one, never were the doors of his house open without our being there. And then this is not an urging that um, there's some call for you to be at Emmanuel every time the doors are open. This is, this is a reminder of the fact that as you grow in Christ, you love to be around the people who love Jesus. You yearn for connections with them. You need to be reinforced and reminded by them. Sometimes you need to be corrected by them. You just need some time to have a, a point of sanity where somebody comes and reminds you of Jesus and of his importance and of what's really true, and you need those people around you, right? Sometimes just say you're okay, right, while you're freaking out. Or that God's in control. God's in control. I know it doesn't seem like it right now, but God is in control, right? And stop trying to control everything. God has it. You just be faithful today. Did you pray today? No, I didn't, but I railed at everybody else, right? Well, why don't you stop and pray for a moment? That's the kind of thing. A prayer meeting at any hour of the day. I know this for myself. As I grow distant from God, all of a sudden I don't pray very much. I don't pray very much. Have you stopped praying before you go to work because you've done the same thing every day and you don't think you need God for that day of work? Have you stopped praying about your marriage because you're well into it now and you don't think you need any really special help to love your spouse? Has your prayer life reduced itself to crises about God, get me out? Right, those are the kinds of things that God's saying. You've got to return to the first things. And I, I'll tell you, one of the things for me in particular, I have to pray out loud. I know I've said this to you. I have to pray out loud. So I did it today, this, this week, I was walking outside, and I was all caught up with a whole bunch of stuff that I was thinking about, and I walked around my backyard praying out loud. Now, I don't know if anybody else saw me where I was at, but I had to talk out loud because it focuses my mind. I have to talk out loud, and, and the evil one tries to get me not to talk out loud. And then when I don't talk out loud, then I get confused, and, and all of a sudden, I've forgotten where I'm going. Right? I need to pray with other people, right? Maybe you need to start, right? Maybe you need to regroup and recoup uh, prayer before you eat. Maybe you need to recoup prayer before you go to bed. Maybe you need to recoup prayer before you leave the house in the morning. Right, husbands, wives, before you leave the house in the morning, one of you leaves the house in the morning. Walk up to each other, hold each other, and pray together. Pray together. Put your day in Jesus' ear and put yourself under his authority. Maybe you just need to do that. Student, before you get up and you start studying and freaking out over what you have to do, maybe you should pray and invite Jesus into that moment. Okay? All those kind of things. It is the loss of your first love that makes you seek the comfort of your bodies instead of the prosperity of your souls. It's the loss of your false love that makes you more concerned about your reputation, about your physical well-being, than about the glory of Jesus. And I, I fall into that. I'm more worried about how people think about me, how people regard me. Everybody wants to be regarded well. But the point is, yes, I want to be regarded well, but who's doing the regarding? That's the point. I want Jesus to be delighted with me. When I lose my first love, I'm more concerned about you being delighted with me or about my neighbor being delighted with me or my culture being delighted with me or my peers at school being delighted with me. But at the end of the day, I want Christ, right, to be delighted with me, okay? Now, he gives a warning here at the end, and he says, I'm coming as a judge, and I will mothball you. That's my little picture up here. And what he says here is he says, I will come to you, and, and, and if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. Now, we haven't said this about this, but I think the imagery of the lampstand is something that's used all throughout Scripture, and it refers to the people of God being a light, a light of God's truth and God's glory, Right? And I, Jesus is not here canceling people's salvation, right? God is at work, right? Van was talking about uh, if we're not seeing God at work in Xenia, it's because we're not looking. 
It's not because he's not. It's because we're not looking. God is at work accomplishing his purposes, and we're mothballed, we're sidelined because we're not looking and we're not participating with it. Right? Often, God's not answering prayer because you're not praying. Right? He's not answering prayer because you're not praying. You're not seeing God do anything because you're not inviting him into it. Or you're, you're, you're living with, and you need wisdom on something simply because you haven't invited God's wisdom into your life. You haven't been spending time listening to him or asking other people to help you follow him, right? So the issue here is I don't want to be on the sidelines. I don't want to be out, outside of what God's doing. I want to be a part of seeing people come to know Jesus and follow Jesus and, and to keep marriages healthy and people in their right mind, right? And people following Jesus toward other people. He warns us about that. But then he promises, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. I think this is all imagery from John, is that you will know the fullness of the life that he wants you to know if you obey him and follow him, right? And you make him first and pursue him and restore their passion for Jesus. Okay, all of us have known our passion to wax and wane. One of the characteristics of revival that's been defined throughout history is nominal Christians actually become Christians. People who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, and those who follow Christ get a sensitivity to sin and a yearning for the things of God that predominates over everything else. Right? Now, I'm not calling you to an experience. I'm calling you to the practices that God will meet you in them, right? He will meet you in them. Now, I want to say this is last, and I borrowed this unashamedly from John Piper, so it has to be good, right? So I want to, I want to end with this, right? I want to end with this, and I know my time's up, but I just want to say practically then, what about all this? If we have the love of Christ driving us, we're not abandoning the truth, but here's four things, and I'll just, they're just very brief, and I think they're good. Truth always aims at love. You always know that Christ is where he needs to be, creating a passion in your heart if you're telling a person the truth because you love them. Not because you're annoyed with them, not because you hate them, not because you just want to punish them, because truth always aims at love, right? Every parent in here knows this, right? When you tell your kids the truth, you're telling them the truth because you're trying to warn them away from something that's going to hurt them, and you're trying to woo them towards something for their blessing and growth. The second one, love aims at truth, right? Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, right? This is one of the false things as far as a believer. You can't say you love someone and not tell them the truth. There was a, a teacher, I think it was in Loudoun County, who said, I cannot, you cannot force me to lie to my children about who they are. Love does not lie. Love does not lie. And so one of the things that happened, love is not going to cover, right? Because when you lie instead of love, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to protect yourself from the difficulties of the hardness of what it means to love someone. It's selfish, okay? Third one, love shapes how you speak the truth, right? So not only does love aim at truth, not only does uh, truth aim at love, but it shapes how we speak the truth, right? And we all know, right, we've all known this, how to speak the truth in love as opposed to just having your, you know, facial hair blown off by the person who spoke to you with fire and brimstone, right? We all know the difference between it. And we know the difference between somebody who's appealing to us on the basis of love. It didn't mean we responded to it right, but it was hard. It was hard to be angry at it because it was hard to, to, to say that that person didn't care about you. So it shapes how you say it. It shapes the timing. It shapes the words you use. It shapes the tone of voice. It shapes the setting where you're not embarrassing people in front of other people. It shapes all those things. Love shapes it because you care about the person. You want them to get it more than you want to say it. Okay? And then third, truth shapes how to show love. 
By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome, right? Here's, here's a fundamental thing and I'll, I'll end with this and then I'll, I'll pray. When you lose your first love and you lose a trust in Jesus and he becomes distant, you're going to start doubting whether what he calls you to do and to say is the best way to live. And one of the first indicators of your loss of passion for Jesus is your unwillingness to speak the truth as he prescribes it because you're not sure whether it's really good for the people you're going to speak it to. If you love Jesus, you trust Jesus, you're following Jesus, the best thing I can be is a person full of Jesus. I don't know how that person's going to greet that person full of Jesus, but that's the best person I can be for them. They may reject me, they may hate me, they may turn their back on me, but if they do with the heart of Jesus, the heart of Jesus is what? Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. God, have mercy on their soul. God, please open their eyes to the truth. God, please protect me from hatred and anger. God, please help me to stand faithful in this moment. Right? I love the words of Jesus when he speaks in Matthew chapter 10. His encouragement to the disciples. He says, when you represent me, they're going to haul you up in front of uh, authorities. They're going to beat you in the synagogues. They're going to beat you in the public places. Some of you are going to die. And then he says this to them, but don't worry. And I'm thinking, great, don't worry. Don't worry. Like the next words are going to be, and you'll survive all these. And, and Jesus goes, no, don't worry. You'll be able to bear faithful witness to me no matter what situation. And I, my own self is going, hey, Jesus, got a question? Okay, Greg. Jesus, will I survive it? No promises there, Greg. Ultimately, you will. You may die for your faith, Greg, but I'll, I, I, I'm assuming that as a follower of me, the most important thing for you today will be, did I represent Jesus well? And at the end of the day, I want to change ours, not did primarily I stand for the truth, but did I yearn for the hearts of the people who are caught up in sin? Was I broken for them? Am I holding on to the truth with a passion for their souls? Am I brokenhearted? Am I praying for them? Am I, have I given up on them? Right? Will you stand with me as we conclude here today? No, you, you cannot, right? You cannot create a passion in your heart simply by me commanding you to have one. Right? And, and if many of us are honest, right, our Bible study is absent or it's absolutely boring. Our prayer life is spotty if not sporadic or maybe even non-existent unless you're in a crisis. I'm not really involved with somebody who's really probing me and encouraging me in my faith, or maybe I'm not that kind of person in other people's lives. All I'm saying is God has given us these practices to create affections in us. And the way you start back toward Jesus is you get on your knees and you repent of the fact that you've walked away from him. And say, Jesus, I need you to create in me a different passion than I have. Lord, I've become enamored by him. I've been enamored by this situation. I'm all caught up in this. Lord, I need to put you back at the top of my life. And I need a right heart toward you that will give me a right heart toward other people. You begin that. And then day after day, you expose yourself to his word. You talk to him in prayer. And you begin faltering. And as you do, the spirit will warm your heart toward the God that you speak to. Right? So this is not a place for us to feel guilty. It's a place for us to turn and hear the word of Jesus. Let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for all that you've given us. Lord, I confess for myself, Lord, there have been many, many moments where in the face of, of some of the evil that stalks our land, uh, Lord, I've just become enraged and angry. And Lord, I know that you call us to hate evil. But Lord, I know that you also call us, Lord, to yearn for the hearts of people because your will is you don't desire any uh, to be punished, but all to come to repentance. And Lord, I pray for us as the people of God, Lord, I pray that you would help us in these days, 
while it seems like there's chaos all around us and, and some of the most powerful people and influential institutions that are encouraging such darkness and destruction, Lord, I pray for your protection over so many young people who are being robbed of their identity and are being encouraged to take up paths that are destructive. Uh, Lord, I pray, please have mercy on us. And Lord, for us as your people, Lord, may we enter the fray, Lord, with, with hearts broken and yearning, but firmly holding on to you, Lord. Lord, help us to make you first and help us to have the kind of love and, and, and desire for you that we had at first. Lord, bless my brothers and sisters. Lord, guide and direct us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.